Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bay Presbyterian Church on this Lord's Day. It's good to see all of you who are here. It's good to know that there are people watching, we trust, by way of camera. We always have to trust that because we can't see you. But uh, we are glad to have you and uh, always want you to feel welcome to be a part of our services, whether you're able to join online or whether you might even be able to take the jump and join us in person. Please know that you're welcome here as we worship the Lord together. And I just want to say that I am especially glad to have Kathy back home, and she brought Sarah and Ethan with her, and they're over here. And I know others of you have family here, too. I see some folks who uh, are loved and familiar to you all, so welcome one and all. If you have not before filled out one of the welcome cards that you should find in a chair rack nearby, please let us know about your attendance here. You don't have to. Nobody's going to ask you if you did it or not, but uh, we would love to know that you've been here in some form or fashion, so please know that. Uh, just uh, thinking uh, after the service, if you would like to remain after for Sunday school, we have a wonderful opportunity for you right back there in the fellowship hall with Dr. Greg Poland, who will be holding forth today, so please know you're invited to that. Just as far as your bulletin goes, Please uh, take note. First of all, we've got a couple of hymns out of order. Don't worry about it. Just stay with us and do what you're told when the time comes, and all will go well. <laughs> but otherwise, uh, there, is, uh, co there continues to be an insert there regarding Easter lilies. If you would like to place uh, an Easter lily or more in honor or memory of loved ones, there's an insert that will instruct you on how to do that, and you can drop it in the offering plate. Uh, Sunday night, this will be our last Sunday night service for the, se uh, for the season. That will be this evening at 6.30. The Reverend John Anderson, founding pastor of Bay Presbyterian Church, will be holding forth. And word on the street is this is going to be like one of his very best sermons. So <laughs> there you go. The pleasures of God. That will be this evening at 6.30. Hope that you can be here for that. And you can say more about it later, sir. Looking forward to it. Uh, remember, choir rehearsal continues on Tuesday at 6 o'clock for those who would like to be in the choir. That is correct. And tomorrow, if you are interested in membership at Bay Presbyterian Church, we've already been doing sign-ups, but there's still room for a few. If you are interested in coming tomorrow evening, I'll tell you right now, it's, it's going to be Chick-fil-A. We didn't, you know, pull out all the stops and bring in prime ribeye, but we're going to have some Chick-fil-A with, you know, salad and stuff to eat, and we'll talk about membership, and that's at 6 o'clock tomorrow. So if you would like to come and have not signed up or emailed me or let me know in some way, there is still a sheet right over there at that door and would appreciate knowing that. Easter Sunday. That's coming up in a couple of weeks. We will be having our services at these regular times at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. on Easter. But here's the thing to look out for. Following Easter, beginning that next Sunday, April 16th, we will fall back to a single service. So beginning April the 16th, we will be having a single morning service at 10 o'clock. But until then, 9 and 11 with Sunday school in between. But beginning on the 16th, 10 a.m., Sunday school will be at 9. There's not a slide for that, so I was just trying to get that out there to you. Along those lines, as we think about Easter, normally we would have the Lord's Supper next Sunday on the first Sunday of the month, but we're going to postpone that until the following Thursday, at which point we will have a worship service on Maundy Thursday. Remember the word Maundy is closely related to the word mandate, which is closely related to the word command, which has Jesus saying, I give you this command that you love one another as I have loved you. That's where the name comes from. We'll have that service of worship on Thursday prior to Easter at 630, and we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper then. I think that's all. I've written notes, and I think I've managed to interpret most of what I said. I was going to say, but what a joy and privilege it is to worship the Lord together, to be able to come together and know that we have fellowship with God Almighty. It's not just a bunch of people meeting together and doing stuff. We have an audience before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who has promised where two or more are gathered in my name, there I will be present in the midst. So let us worship the Lord our God who is ever present with us and adore his name forever and always.
Good morning. Would you please join me in our call to worship, which is inside your bulletin, the front cover. Today we're reading from 1 Timothy 1, 15 to 17. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe in him. Now, to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand to our feet and worship as we proclaim, and can it be?
Lord Jesus, amazing love indeed. Lord, come and be among us and with us. For you and you alone are our prophet, priest, and king. Thank you, Lord, that by your death and resurrection, you overcame sin and you set us free. Send to, Lord, your Holy Spirit to dwell within us. For we desire to rightly praise and worship you and to rightly hear and discern your word. For there are no other words by which we are saved. And grant, Lord, that we are truly set aside for your service and the grace and wisdom to care for the vulnerable. And Lord, we pray that all the world will hear your word for those hardened by sin, for those far away who are enemies of your cross. Open their hearts and our hearts to your truth. And so we beseech you, Lord, and pray that which you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. This is the reading of the word of God, 2 Samuel 9, 1 through 13. And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul, whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machir, the son of Emil at Lodabar. Then king David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Emil at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house, I have given to your master's grandson, and you and your sons and your servants 
shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord, the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. Have our ushers come forward as we continue our worship with our tithes and giving. Lord, we have come here this morning to worship you, to praise you, and to be obedient to you in our tithes and our giving. Let us not hoard where moth and rust destroy, nor harden our hearts to the needs of our fellow man. Lord, we give ourselves just as you gave yourself to us. We give back a generous portion of what you have blessed us with, for we want to be found obedient, Lord to give a generous measure, pressed down, shaken, and running over. For by the measure we give, so too shall it be measured to us. Hear now, Lord, our tithes. Multiply them, we pray, that the many needs locally and around the world may be met. In your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Would the choir please come forward? Many composers, they write songs from, that are inspired by scripture. But some composers, they write music to scripture itself. And that's one of the cases today, the song that we will sing. Um, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we have already sung about that in the fourth verse. But... Uh, then we're going to add the, uh, the, the uh, Psalms 32. Blessed, blessed are those whose sins are separated from God, that he has forgiven each one of our sins, that we might stand before him pure and spotless as Jesus is. There is therefore now no condemnation. <laughs>
I thought, what hymn could we sing after? What can we do but just thank the Lord for this scripture? That there's no condemnation. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. His grace exceeds our sin and our guilt. It might not say that in the bulletin that that's the next song, but it is. So pull out the sheet if you need it. It's on the, the screens. And I'm going to ask that everybody stand in it as we sing this. Continue to worship with this tune, with this song, with this wonderful worship. But just listen to the choir now as they sing. Join them in a minute. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Thank you, Gordian Choir. And at this time, I'd ask you to pull out from your bulletins your prayer sheet. And I'd like for you to add to that Augie Doms, D-A-H-M-S. Uh, Augie fell late last week and crushed his pelvis and was in significant pain. Uh, I am told this morning that the pain is somewhat abated and uh, he's off some of the pain meds now. So we want to keep on praying for Augie that he can recover from this at least enough to get ambulatory. So Augie Doms will be added to that. And I'm sure that <clears throat> many of you have your own concerns or those of family and loved ones, so I'd ask you to silently pray for those things 
and what you have listed here, and I'll conclude after a few moments. Let's go to God in prayer. Our great God and Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise today because you are indeed the great God. You are a God who takes pleasure in your people, in the prayers of the righteous. God, thank you for that great and precious uh, statement of fact that you are the great God. God, we thank you that you're involved with your creation and, uh, and that all of your creation sings to you. It's a symphony, a harmony of, of all of your creation. Jesus said that if his disciples didn't praise him, then the rocks along the side of the road would. And God, uh, we, we know that even emanating from the bodies in space, there is praise that's sung to our Lord Jesus Christ. God, we pray that, uh, that we would add to that this morning so that we'd be a pleasing aroma to you. Father, we would want to pray for our men and women who are serving the country. Pray that you'd bring them safety and success. Pray the same for our first responders. And then, God, we would pray for those who are experiencing health concerns. We want to pray for Sharon Klopp, who is... Uh, really struggling at this moment, and pray that you give her strength. Pray for Augie Doms as he recovers from that terrible fall that he took this late last week, and pray that you would lend him your healing hand as he seeks to recover. Pray for Janet Hartman, uh, convalescing from knee surgery, but <clears throat> with complications, and pray that you would help her work through those and get to the point where she is back to 100% again. God, so many more things that we have to pray for. We pray, we'd lift these things before you and pray that you might minister to each according to their needs. And then thank you, God, for the, the, ministry, uh, the ministries with which we're associated and pray for the Cafe of Life. And God, we would also pray for uh, the, the work in Romania Derek Kreider and family as they work with college students in Romania, such a strategic ministry, God, we pray that you'd bless them in that work. And now, God, we pray for our pastor, that you would bless him, that his words would be the words that would be those from your lips. And God, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would fall upon each of us, that we might hear your word, because today we would see Jesus, and we pray in his name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Much to remember in prayer, isn't there? Been the terrible tornado devastation up in Mississippi. Want to continue, of course, to pray for uh, De uh, Denise Thompson and the loss of Gary, who's gone home to be with the Lord, and the family having to sort through matters there. Also, I failed to mention during announcements, uh, Tom Rogers told us this past week that he and Lauren are picking up and moving to California. Now, that has not been approved by this church yet. <clears throat> but uh, Tom will be retiring as our bookkeeper. We'll be looking to fill that position, but mostly our hearts are going to be a little emptier with you folks gone. But it's okay. We're going forth into the world. So, having mentioned those things, let's, uh, Pastor John's behest, and that's a good suggestion, let's bow once more for prayer. Father in heaven, we do pray for Denise Thompson and her family and this devastating loss of Gary. Lord, we know there's much to work through, as there always is in matters like this. Please help them, comfort them, strengthen them, encourage them. We certainly pray for those who are facing the devastation of loss from storms in Mississippi. Please be with those dear folks. Help them beyond uh, this uh, time and moment that they may look to you. Even as a weatherman prayed for them, looking at the radar, we're grateful, Lord, that you have your people in places seeking you. Thank you for Tom and Lauren. We pray you'll bless them as they go from us in these uh, coming weeks. Please provide for all of us 
Lord, we're all coming and going on our way to our final destination. Bless us that we may be faithful unto you. And as we now open your word, equip us for the journey that we're on, that we may know Jesus better in order that we may better make him known. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, all of us from time to time need a little vision correction. Sometimes things get in our eyes, cause us not to be able to see as we might. So we're going to be looking today in Luke chapter 6, beginning with verse 37, as we continue along in the gospel according to Luke, reminding ourselves that the doctor has good news. We've got doctors in the house here. I'm looking at a few of you now, and others who are in the medical profession. And I'm so grateful for all of you and for others of you who assist us in so many ways. But Luke, known as a physician, delivers for us this wonderful account of the life of the Lord Jesus, his teaching ministry. And we have this book, we have this word because we need instruction. We need, uh, we need uh, the Lord Christ, not only as our Savior, but our teacher and our guide. And we'll be looking, among other things, at one verse that is probably the most oft-quoted and the most often misapplied verse in all of Scripture. Nobody else knows any Bible verse. They know this one, judge not, and typically abuse it. But let's look together at all of this as we consider from God's word, these words. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. And so may the Lord bless this reading of his word. For as we say, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord really does stand forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached to you. Amen. And so Jesus is our authority. The Lord God Almighty is our authority. He is the one who has created us. He is the one who has formed and fashioned us in his image. <clears throat> and he has not left us to grope blindly along seeking our way, as the deists believe that somehow God created everything and then went off somewhere to wait until the clock ran down and then show up at the end. God is involved in our lives from day to day. And a primary way in which the Lord is involved in our lives is through his word, through his teaching ministry, as it has been recorded faithfully for us. And Jesus here on this occasion is not preaching the Sermon on the Mount that we have recorded in Matthew, but very similar teaching that was taught at another time and place on a plain, as we refer to it. Luke's passage here is entitled the Sermon on the Plain, or is often referred to in that way. And so having already said some hard things, you know, like love your enemies, no one else had really said that before. Jesus went on from there and enjoined his disciples to be merciful even as your father is merciful. So just on the heels of that comes these words, again, often quoted, especially at Christians, right? Judge not, and you will not be judged. So what does this mean? Does this mean we can't exercise discernment? Does this mean we can't look at an atrocious serial killer and the havoc that is wrought from that and say that's evil and that's wrong? Of course, it doesn't mean that. The Lord Jesus, after all, goes on and calls people hypocrites at the in the very passage that we've read about, he pronounced woes unto those who live contrary to God's word. Of course, there is the exercising of discernment. What he's talking about here is a kind of judgment that is rendered without mercy, a kind of harsh judgment that relegates people to uh, even a position of damnation in eternity without regard to those people. Um, and we can do that very easily, can't we? We just write people off. 
I have to admit, I've done it before. I've given up on folks thinking that they just didn't want anything to do with the Lord. And yet I've seen them come graciously and gloriously to a saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and just absolutely proved me wrong about them. And then I think maybe perhaps God's grace has proved other people wrong about me through the years. I think about some of the things teachers had to put up with when I was going through school. And I've wondered if some of those teachers didn't look and say, what is he ever going to amount to? And they may still be wondering that. <laughs> but we must render judgment in a way that's, that's gracious and loving and merciful, even as we call evil for what it is, even as we accept sin as God defines it. Of course we exercise judgment in that way, but not in the ultimate sense. God takes care of things. I was called on to do a funeral service one time, and a family member came up to talk to me about the deceased and told me what a horrible person that he was. And he said, I believe he's in hell right now. And he said, are you going to tell him that? I said, I can't tell them that. I don't know. I said, have you ever read about the thief on the cross? That in the last moments of life, that man on the cross looked to Jesus and said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, Today, you will be with me in paradise. I said, undoubtedly, this man heard the gospel at some point in his life. It is possible he responded even in those last moments of life. It is not my responsibility to relegate him to his place in eternity. My place is here to proclaim to you the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am perfectly content to leave with God the one who has gone, and he has done what is right and good and just, and I was content to leave it at that. And I believe that is one way in which we are to not judge because God works according to his own ways and according to his own kindness. And we need to be instructed in this because we have a natural tendency to judge in a condemning way. But those of us who have received grace have had our lives upended. Grace changes everything. Those who receive God's grace readily extend grace to others even as we continue to receive it. That's such wonderful news. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Infinite grace. Can't be exhausted. Everything I know of in life can be exhausted. You know, everything from my favorite cereal to ice cream. I was thinking about that in the grocery store with Kathy coming home. I had this longing to want to get for her one of her favorite cereals. And it's uh, peanut butter checks. We got it for a good while. We ate it. We loved it. And now we can't find it anywhere. It's like they just, they found out we liked it and they snatched it off the shelf. You know, we'll show them. It was not an inexhaustible supply. And that bothers me. Ice cream runs out. Did you know that? I had a cousin who was a World War II veteran. He used to tell me, he said, you know, when you eat ice cream, he said, it's not a matter of getting full on it. It just melts and goes away. He said, you just run out of time. <laughs> but everything can be exhausted, but not God's grace. God's grace is this, this infinite deposit from which we are able to draw. And as grace has been freely given to us, grace is something that we, having received it, freely give to others. Because we hear the warning from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, verse 2. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. How thankful I am that God doesn't deal with me the way that I have a tendency when it comes to dealing with others. But his patience is so much more exceeding that he is so much more gracious and loving and long-suffering. And, of course, we pray each Lord's Day, forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Or forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. What's it saying there? Is it, does it mean that God ultimately is going to base his forgiveness on what I do? No. It's a statement of grace. I forgive because I've been forgiven. And therefore, as I forgive others, I'm, I'm demonstrating that forgiveness that I've received. So in forgiving others, I'm showing that I am forgiven and couldn't and shouldn't hold anything against others. Eric Wright, in Revolutionary Forgiveness, tells the story of a woman who offered grace, even though she was a victim of a horrible crime. 
A Turkish officer had raided her Armenian home years ago. He killed both of her parents and gave the daughters, her sisters, to the soldiers who were with him. He kept the oldest daughter for himself. Sometime later, she escaped and trained as a nurse. As time passed, she found herself nursing in a ward of Turkish officers. One night, by the light of a lantern, she saw the face of this very officer. He was so gravely ill that without exceptional nursing, he would die. The days passed and he recovered. One day, the doctor stood by the bed with her and said to him, but for her devotion to you, you would be dead. He looked at her and said, we have met before, haven't we? Yes, she said, we have met before. Why didn't you kill me, he asked. She replied, I am a follower of him who said, love your enemy. I can't imagine that. The Armenian woman did more for her enemy than simply forgive him. She offered him the gift of her love. She learned to do this from Jesus. How else would that be possible except by God's grace, the one who had first loved her? It's a test of true discipleship, as Phil Riken has said. And every day for us is an opportunity for us to demonstrate the grace that has been given, whether it's in a conflict with a spouse or family member or loved one, or whether it's just in our general attitude when we're watching the news. Opportunities for us to demonstrate that we have an understanding of grace and to extend forgiveness and to give as it's been given to us. As we think of the generosity of God, God is exceedingly generous and providing for us far and above anything that we could ask or think. And so we have this as the one who is at work in us is the one who is like this, the one who gives beyond all measure. And he uses this app description, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. But with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. A kind of giving that goes beyond anything that the world is able to conjure up itself. Now let's be clear. There are a lot of unbelievers who shame us with their own generosities and kindnesses. It is uh, one of those truths that we realize that uh, as we go through life. But yet, in the course of time, as those who trust in Jesus, it should be inevitable that we are becoming more like Jesus becoming more like him as he works in us and as we are instructed by him in his word. That's why gatherings like this are essential. That's why the books like this were written, so that they could be read in gatherings like this and someone talk about them and expound them and apply them and give us opportunities to think of ways that we can actually apply the things we say we believe. And so this generosity of living is at the center of it all. There's a, an example that uh, J. Jeremiah gives in uh, a book entitled The Parables of Jesus in describing this whole scenario of uh, good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, placed in your lap. The seller crouches on the ground with the measure between his legs. First of all, he fills the measure three quarters full and gives it a good shake with a rotary motion to take the grains and settle them down. Then he fills the measure to the top, gives it another shake. Next, he presses the corn together strongly with both hands. And finally, he heaps it into a cone, tapping it carefully to press the grains together. From time to time, he bores a hole in the cone and pours a few more grains into it until there is literally no more room for a single grain. In this way, the purchaser is guaranteed an absolutely full measure. It cannot hold more there in a Near Eastern bazaar. So we think about the ways in which the Lord has uh, pressed down, shaken together, so that there's, there's a fullness of grace. There's no lack of it. And then it should be our practice also to, to do the very same. My grandmother ran a little store 
on Hyatt Creek, it's Hyatt Creek Grocery. I can remember kids coming in. You remember when you used to, you could get candy for half a cent? You know, one penny will get you two. Can you buy anything for a penny anymore? But I remember kids would come in from the area and remember one little kid in particular just laying out a bunch of change on the counter and said, Miss Allie, what can I get for that? She reached around to the candy box behind her and started pulling things out, spending the money, this, that, the other. I don't like that too good. She put that back and got another one, flavor they liked. And, and then in the end, you know, she gave a little extra. Always, one or two extra. The Lord works in that way. And as we have the opportunity in this life to live for him, it is a wonderful thing for us to be able to, to give as has been given to us. So you have to ask the question, what of Jesus do people really see in us? Beyond our ability to articulate creeds and confessions of faith, to be able to recite the Lord's Prayer or to sing hymns. I was talking to somebody this morning who said that uh, has a loved one who is uh, experiencing mental decline, but yet able to recall the wonderful hymns of the faith and sing them perfectly. And what a wonderful blessing that is. But beyond the ability to do that, what do people see in us that would in some way remind them of what God is like in terms of grace and forgiveness and generosity? I can think of numbers of examples in my own life. But what an opportunity for us to be that example in the lives of others. Not because you're trying to get something. We're not trying to earn points with God. Remember, that's not possible. Jesus has done all of the earning. He's given us his reward. But in order to demonstrate what we have received, what are we doing to show forth that love, kindness, forgiveness, and generosity? Because ultimately, we become like those who teach us. He tells the parable, can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? Have you ever been in a circumstance where you were trying to get help from someone who didn't know any better how to get you out of the problem than you did? I remember on the side of the road one time, I was, uh, battery was, uh, I thought my battery was dead. And you know, you do what you do. You stop and you get out and you open the hood and you look at the engine like you know what you're doing. <laughs> that just seems to be the thing to do. This was in the day before cell phones, so... I was looking at my engine, and this fellow pulled up, and he stopped, and he came over, and he looked at the engine with me. And he said, something wrong? And I wanted to say, no, I just like to pull over to the side of the road, <laughs> look at the motor every once in a while, make sure it's still in there. I didn't do that. I wasn't that facetious. But, you know, we were looking at it, and, you know, you jiggle this wire and jiggle that wire, and nothing happens. And then finally somebody came along who knew something, and he looked, and he pulled back, and he said, I didn't notice there was a cover over it. There was, and I should have corrosion on the battery post he said oh we can fix this in a second he went in the truck got out a bottle of coca-cola poured it right on my battery post and it fired right up and the other fella who was like me who didn't know that much, there's dave young back there grinning um who didn't know much better than me he said huh that's something he said coca-cola he said what if you'd had a pepsi and the guy looked at him and he said never work <laughs> Too many of us are submitting ourselves to teachers who don't know any more about life than we do. But unfortunately, we're going to wind up in a destination if we keep following them. Whether it's personalities that media presents or writers or even some preachers, we've got to ask ourselves, who is leading us? Are they really enlightened in the true knowledge of God? Because we become like those that we allow to be our instructors. Scripture is full of warnings. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. That's a picture that's often used, but it comes straight from Scripture. People who appear to be one thing, but who are somebody else. You've got discernment as a child of God. Use it. Let the Spirit of God within you as you are informed by the Word of God. When you hear something that's stupid, don't follow it. When people say things that are contrary to the word of God, they are wrong. Don't be afraid to admit that to yourself. And listen to truth. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 Test everything. 
hold fast what is good. Just because somebody is articulate, well-educated, those things aren't bad in and of themselves. But in and of themselves, they are not sufficient. You can be highly intelligent, highly articulate, and completely devoid of truth. Test everything. Hold what is good. Don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. If it was true in the day that John wrote that in the first century, it is certainly true now. Those who are antichrist, those who are not of God, who seek an audience. And then, of course, to the teachers themselves, James says, not many of you should even become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. All of that tells me that there's much that we need to take to heart concerning who we follow and course how we teach a disciple is not above his teacher but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher it stands to reason doesn't it whatever you're filling yourself up with during the week that's pretty much what's coming out of you that's what your life is looking like and so if you're looking at yourself in the mirror and you don't like what you see and you're not seeing Christ flow out of you and you're not seeing these attributes in some way being discernible in your life, you've got to ask, what am I putting in there? Who am I following? Who's instructing me? And of course, coming back to his theme about not judging, we all know, and it's a very obvious illustration, you can't deal with the speck in someone else's eye if you literally have a log in your own. If our vision is so obscured that we are unable to see clearly, how can we help others? And as we read on through that very familiar passage, just reminding ourselves to help restore others from their sins, we must humbly and honestly repent of our own. Jesus didn't need to repent. Jesus, being the sinless Son of God, was readily able at all times to help others and to assist them. But we are in desperate need of forgiveness and grace working in us if we're going to be an instrument of good in the lives of others. And think of the ways in which so many have in, been instruments of good in the lives of others. And of, uh, and of giving. I ran across another example as we think of this whole matter, measure for measure. I don't know why it seems to be striking medical themes today, but here we are anyway. There was a Scottish farmer named Fleming. One day the farmer heard a cry from behind a log building in a bog on his property. And there mired to his waist in black muck was a terrified boy screaming and struggling to free himself. The farmer named Fleming saved the lad from what could have been a slow and terrifying death. The next day, a fancy carriage pulled up to the Scotsman's humble dwelling. An elegantly dressed nobleman stepped out and introduced himself as the father of the boy the farmer had saved. I want to repay you, the nobleman said. You saved my son's life. The Scottish farmer refused the offer, but at that moment, his own son came to the door. Is that your son? The nobleman asked. Let me take him and give him a good education. If the lad is anything like his father, he'll grow up to be a man we can be proud of. And in time... The farmer's son graduated from St. Mary's Hospital Medical School in London, and he later became known throughout the world as Sir Alexander Fleming, the developer of penicillin. Many years later, when the nobleman's son was stricken with pneumonia, his life was saved by the very drug that Fleming had discovered. And that man's name was Sir Winston Churchill. Now, I can't guarantee that when the next person you show or that you see that needs an act of kindness and you demonstrate them will go out and develop the absolute cure for COVID or cancer. But I can tell you this. You can't outgive and you can't outdo God. That inasmuch as we give and we demonstrate generosity having received grace, God's grace will continue to abound toward us. And so it is absolutely necessary that we deal graciously with people around us, even when we disagree with them vehemently. I was once called uh, to a radio station to, uh, to debate a matter that was before our electorate in the town we were living in. I won't go into the details. 
but I was there, and the young lady who was in opposition to me on the other side of the matter, as we were talking, it was very clear that we disagreed about the issue strongly. But I also understood, even in my immaturity, that I needed to be gracious. And so I was just as gracious as I could be in, in disagreeing and stating my position. It was a few months later that she and her family started attending our church. And I said, oh, wow, I must have won you over. And she said, well, I still think you're wrong. <laughs> she said, I saw something in you that I haven't seen in other people. She said, lots of people were very mean to me about this whole matter. And she said, I don't know what you've got, but I came here to see what it is. Now, that doesn't say anything about me. That says everything about the Lord who is working in this poor, miserable sinner to overcome the tendencies in me that would cause people to be repelled rather than attracted to the things of God. But brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you be tempted to. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Does it really not come down to that? Who am I anyway? I'm a child of God, an object of his grace, being saved by his grace. That's all that commends me to my Lord in heaven. So be gracious and kind and loving with others. And that in so doing, we may find ourselves bearing a witness. Who knows? how they may respond. Sure, they may continue to reject us and think we're off our noodle. But on the other hand, I want to live the way that Jesus would have me live. I found someone in him who is unmatched and unparalleled. There's no one else out there who can vie for the position that he alone should have in my life. And I pray that in you also, it's everything, it has everything to do with him. Dying to self, living unto Christ, exalting him, living for him. Not just showing up for a worship service on a Sunday, but looking at every day as an opportunity to worship the Savior, to know him more fully, that we may more fully make him known. May God bless you as you think about that. Father in heaven, we praise you for our Lord Jesus Christ and for all that he teaches and instructs us. And Lord, we we ask forgiveness. We fall so far short of these instructions in so many ways. I'm ashamed to think of how, even where there have been a few minor successes here and there, there have been major failures elsewhere. So, Lord, grant that we may deal with each other in the way that we find ourselves dealt with by you, graciously in long-suffering mercy. Lord, that we may be a church that is alive to the things of Christ, demonstrating to the world who Jesus really is. And living as if we really do know the one who is love and grace manifest, now reigning, whose return we long for. It's in his name we pray. Amen. How will they know we are Christians? By our love. Let's stand together and sing it.
And so may the love of God our Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with and abide with you all, both now and forevermore. And everyone said together, Amen. Amen.